I think you're totally right that we we don't always just have to take what we're given. I think that the the more inexperienced teachers tend to just say, this is my budget, this is what I'm stuck with. But if you can create a really compelling case for why you need something in your classroom, why you need this investment in technology for, you know, so that you can offer individualized feedback on student performance exams, you know, that's something that is super essential to the education and learning and benefit of the program as a whole. And so if, yes. if you really can justify that, then why not go after it? You, we don't well, just have to take what we're given. Let's march. <laughs> well, that's the whole thing is you have to ask. The only thing they can say is no. You are listening to the Music Ed Mentor Podcast, where we teach music educators how to build, manage, and grow thriving school music programs and have long and happy careers. I am your host, Elisa Jansen-Jones. You can follow my music education blog at professionalmusiceducator.com, and in just a few weeks, you can meet me at the International Music Education Summit, where I will be teaching about the easiest ways to get funding for your music program. The summit is 100% online, so you can attend from anywhere in the world, and until the end of May, you can register for just $97. And if you enter the code podcast at checkout, you get 10% off for access to 60 plus professional development hours. That's an amazing value. And I hope you can attend friends. I know this is a bit longer episode than we typically do. And I was really tempted to make it a two parter. But if you've ever wondered about which technology you should be using in your classroom and which tech can make your job easier and which technology you can get for free, this episode will be your go-to resource. If you have to listen to it in two parts, then please do. By making it one episode, we're giving you all the info without having to wait for the next episode. You're welcome. Now, our last episode was all about optimizing your time at the end of the school year. Our discussion today dovetails into that really nicely. I told you last time about how I have gone in the last few weeks from being the part-time K-4 music teacher at my school to the full-time K-8 teacher, including band and choir. I also shared some of the things I'm doing to maximize my efficiency due to this particular change. You know, life hacks I've been living. If you feel like your to-do list just keeps growing, I encourage you to go to professionalmusiceducator.com and search for life hacks. I share all my best tips in that post. When my principal asked me to come on full-time next year, this was a few months ago he asked this, uh, it was before I became full-time this year due to our current band director's illness, the first thing I thought of was how I need to make lesson planning easier. I need to minimize the time I'm spending on prep and maximize the efficiency of teaching to my students. This means giving them lots of resources for practicing at home, among other things. I don't want to use class time for assessments. I don't want to keep practice logs. I don't want to be creating resources for every single K-4 lesson. So I've turned to technology. For K-4 classes, I've decided to use a combination of two online resources, a subscription to K-8 magazine, so I get the appropriate, fresh, and fun repertoire they send right to me, including accompaniment tracks, PowerPoints, and printables. Music library, check. For the curriculum, I've decided to go with Quaver. Their pre-developed lesson plans offer me the efficiency I need while still providing me the flexibility to use the resources I want or switch out their resources for some of my own. No, these programs are not free, but they are absolutely worth it to me to use my budget for maximum efficiency. Money is time and time is money. Now I've turned to the band and choir situation. With this, I'm a little more challenged. I haven't taught middle school band since 2007. And back then, I didn't need any tech resources because there weren't that many to choose from anyway. I taught my students the way I was taught, and that had nothing to do with computers. All I needed was a stereo. Heck, I use a lot more technology now teaching K4 than I ever have before. 
So my question going into this episode was, what is there out there that other people already successfully use? What's cheap or free since I'm already using a large chunk of my budget for Quaver? Can these tech tools maximize my efficiency without requiring me to spend hours getting trained in how to use them and how to set them up? Is there one go-to tool or do I need a set of tools? And how do I decide which ones to use and when to implement them? To help me answer these questions, I interviewed two of my most tech-savvy contacts, Stephen Keyes and Ryan Sargent. Stephen is a Google certified educator and trainer and Apple teacher and a Flipgrid ambassador and a Soundtrap certified educator. He's also a band teacher. Ryan is vice president of TIME, Technology Institute for Music Education, the leading professional organization for the integration of technology in music education. He also happens to work for Make Music. He's their social media manager and a former band teacher. Both of these fine educators are also presenters for this year's International Music Education Summit. I started by doing some research first to see if there was one tool that could tick all the boxes for me efficiency-wise. You see, I'd been using smart music for private lessons already, but beyond the online player and the built-in scales and drills, I couldn't imagine how I would use it as a resource in the band room. Forgive me, but I didn't start to realize the many features of smart music until I started doing the research and seeing how other teachers are implementing it in their classroom. But I had questions that still weren't answered. So I got my buddy Ryan on to answer them for me and hopefully answer them for you. Now, I don't want you to think this is a sales pitch for smart music. Honestly, I asked Ryan some direct and pointed questions. Not all of them are softballs. I haven't purchased smart music for my school yet, and maybe you won't ever either. Whether you do or not, this podcast at least, and all the awesome blog posts you'll find at smartmusic.com will continue to be free to you as awesome resources from smart music. Sure, they want to sell some product, but they truly want to support music educators even more. So stay with me here because these tips and tricks are awesome. Without further ado, let's learn more about how we can implement some awesome tech into our music classrooms. My name is Ryan Sargent. Uh, I work at Smart Music at Make Music in Boulder, Colorado. I'm also on the board of TIME, the Technology Institute for Music Educators. Um, So I'm always talking about music technology and ways that teachers can use technology in the classroom. And you're doing a music classroom technology presentation for the International Music Education Summit in June too, right? I am. I'm doing a couple, actually. So one of them is going to focus on the ways that nonprofits can help you and your program and your kids. You'd be shocked at how much money and how much of the advocacy resources that are out there go unused. um, And you can take advantage of them. I'm also doing one about differentiated instruction, which is kind of a, a pet topic of mine. I think that one is going to be just so super valuable. I was musing today in my classroom with a bunch of kindergartners in there, how some really learn better by watching, some learn better by touching, um, some learn, some seem to learn better when they're sitting on your lap. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't have to be hard, right? You don't have to come up with a separate lesson plan for every kid, but mm-hmm. we can do so much better than addressing feedback only to the flutes or only to the trombones. That doesn't count as differentiated instruction. Yeah, I always uh, try to come up with three different ways to teach the same subject. Is that kind of the the vein you're going to go into? Yeah, exactly. Um, And if one of those ways is working really well for kids that are more advanced and one of those ways is working really well for kids that are struggling, you're totally on the right track. Mm, Understood. Okay, so I, I'm so glad you came on to talk to me about technology. Um, in my quest of efficiency, I've kind of gone insane ever since I accepted the position to um, teach full time next year, which means adding in the band. Congratulations! Oh, thank you, thank you. It's it's going to be really fun. Band is just a, a whole different world. Instrumental in general is, you know. And then of course the kids are 
so much older, but I had some parents ask, so are you just going to, you know, just do band? And <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm adding band. I'm going to be the music teacher for the school. So anyway. I, I love this. Do you this, love it? <laughs> this is exactly the kind of thing that music teachers do that everyone else thinks is crazy and music teachers know is totally normal. You chose a hairstyle based on efficiency. Yeah, I figure I'm a pretty good looking girl. I'm going to look fine even if I'm bald, right? So, <laughs> I mean, I can't say that too loudly. My friends at St. Baldrick's will be like, you should shave. And I'm going to be like, no. Um, when my principal offered me to come on full time, the first thing I said was, I'm going to need some software. Like, I'm going to need an online curriculum because right now I'm planning out every single lesson, every single day and collecting and purging and selecting all the resources myself and learning all the resources too. So right now I'm just looking at like, how can I be most efficient? So I'm going to start with this question for you, Ryan. And I did not prep you for it at all. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. How are music teachers using technology in their classrooms? I, I'm going to use it for efficiency, but are they using it for improving their practice or what? You tell me. Efficiency is a big one. Music teachers don't have a lot of extra time and that's in the best of situations, right? For every music teacher that feels like they don't have enough time that sees their kids five days a week, there's a teacher out there that only sees their kids three days a week and really feels trapped for time. So efficiency is a big one. Um, I think using apps, whether it's because your school's one-to-one Chromebook or because this is something that is paid and and you want to make it available to all your kids, um, any of those options help help drive efficiency. Another big way teachers are using technology these days is to make sure that they're addressing national core art standards that sometimes slip through the cracks with instrumental music. I didn't do any composition in high school band. I, I just didn't. And that's just, that's not the case anymore. There's so many apps out there now that give teachers the ability to incorporate things like creating, composing, theory, all of that stuff directly into an instrumental ensemble curriculum. So that's another place where technology is doing some heavy lifting. Um, I think the third place then is as a dedicated music technology curriculum. Um, I've talked to teachers all over the country that are making this a big part of what their district does. And that has huge implications for the future of, of music in both education and just in the world. Companies like Make Music want kids that have a music technology background because we need people for jobs. This is something that, that is preparing kids for the job market, even when they're in middle school or high school. And it's, it's showing them that they can follow their passion of music without feeling like they need to give up their, a, a future. They're not going to be stuck um, kind of on a one track path, even in, in college. Nice. Like those uh, trombone majors, huh? Exactly. Right. I, I have a degree in trauma performance and I, I'm a social <laughs> media manager. So no, you're, you're a perfect example though, which is why I'm so glad you came on. Okay. So what you're saying is that people don't want to be like the lead singer in the band on the stage. They don't want to be Bono or Sting or Adam Levine. I'm dating myself here. They want to be like Avicii who is the music producer. Yeah. I, I mean that there's, I think that applies to to both of the kind of these technology tracks, one where teachers can use technology to help foster um, creativity, compositional skills, theory skills. And then the other side of it is there's a wealth of career potential for kids that are growing up now in the music industry. Major music companies need they're going to need employees. And and so kids that have a background in education, whether that's music production, whether that's um, just understanding the music industry because they're familiar with the tools, um, all of that sets them up for success in the future. Uh, in addition to just teaching them good skills about how to use tech, how to troubleshoot tech, um, how, to, how to leverage tools when they actually go to create a piece of music. So let's talk about smart music because it is on my radar of things that I'm 98% sure I want to get in my classroom because yeah. it's only $40 for the year. So that's totally affordable for me as a teacher, but I have mainly used it for personal practice and for supporting my private student practices. So what are some ways that smart music is helpful in the classroom? Walk me through how a classroom teacher might use some of the smart music features. Yeah. So like you mentioned, 
teacher subscription for next year is only $40 and that's access to the web-based version. So right there, just in that package, you can start using it in class um, by yourself. You can project it on the board. Um, you can project it on a smart board, all that kind of stuff. So right there, you're offering a visual representation of things. We need to talk about dotted rhythms today. Now we can actually pull up up an exercise, I can show it to the whole class. I can have the class clap along with it. I can have the class sing and finger. I can have the class, you know, whichever model you want to do to pass on that new rhythmic information, you can have an actual example on the board. Um, you can make sure that kids have access to an amazing reference recording for anything you're playing at the concert um, because the Smart Music Library provides those reference recordings. So when you, um, when you have kids working on a piece that you know is going to be performed, they aren't worried about, oh, what does this sound like? They aren't guessing anymore because they have that reference. And you can also pull that up for them in class. You're not struggling to find examples anymore. Um, you can also use this to uh, help those struggling kids or struggling sections. Maybe the clarinet section has a really tough part in this piece. Use smart music to pull that up for them. Um, and then you can have the cursor track the clarinet part on the board so that they can watch their part go through while everyone else takes a turn playing. They are able to now hear their peers. They're going to know exactly what it feels like to sit there. They have the visual reinforcement on the board complete with something moving along to show them where they're at in their part. I also need to, this, this is totally funny. I used a different method book every year for the first three years that I taught band. And then of course I, quit teaching band and orchestra full time to stay home with my kids and start my own private lesson studio. Well, now I'm looking at it again and I go into the music store and the guy says, well, what music book are you going to use? Cause you know, he's super anxious to support me cause I'm awesome. Right. And I was like stumped. I mean, the, the current teacher at my school has used standard of excellence forever in a day. And I've used standard of excellence forever in a day but I'm interested in some other options. And I know smart music does like background support recordings and stuff for a few of them. Which ones are supported by smart music? Yes. Yeah, so we have more than 90 method books in there now that includes band, orchestra, choir, sight singing, all, all kinds of things, recorder, guitar. Um, so there's more than 90 method books. And that again, a $40 subscription gets the teacher access to all of them. So you could preview them and choose which one you want for the kids. Um, we're also, then setting up a new pricing tier for kids where for $4 a student, they would get access to all 90 method books also. So you could potentially switch method books mid-year if you found that one was really good for the first part of the year, but by the end of the year, you wanted to move to something else. Um, and that would all have, the kids would have access to all of that um, from day one. So that flexibility with uh, that approach is, is one, definitely one option that, um, we know beginning band and orchestra, um, teachers have heavily wanted to take advantage of. Um, one of the ones that I think we support the best is sound innovations. Uh, we've got a great relationship with the authors, um, uh, Bob Phillips on the orchestra side and uh, Chris Bernotis and uh, Peter Boonshaft on the band side. And so they actually have gone in and helped our repertoire team and made sure that all those accompaniments are, are locked in. As long as they can help teach beginning band players to play more than four measure phrases, like that would be great. Yes. <laughs> yeah, actually. So um, I, I know uh, Chris Bernard is pretty well uh, met up with him at a bunch of conferences and he's actually gone through and written a bunch of the corrals that are in the back of the book and, and set those up as a band director would want them set up. He's a band director first and almost a composer second. So um, it's one of the reasons I, I love SI. Awesome. I'm totally going to look into that now. I would probably be the only teacher in Western Colorado to use it. Yeah. Uh, I use, I use standard of excellence too when I taught in Boulder. So even in uh, Eastern Colorado. Well, there you go. So talk to me about the assessment options. How can that help ease my worry? Cause I'll tell you how I used to do it. I did it the way my dad taught me to do it, which is all the kids sit there and you let them play one at a time to do their playing test, right? Yep. Yep. And everybody had to be quiet while the other playing test was going along. And there were some great things about this. They got to hear everybody. The person playing the test uh, got to treat it as a solo. So it was able to build their confidence. They got immediate feedback. I would always try and say what they did 
really great first and then give them some things that they could work on, in which case all the classmates are learning from that, ideally, unless they're sitting there reading Harry Potter or something, (laughs) I guess. I was probably guilty of that in my younger days anyway. uh, So anyway, there's lots of great things about it. But I do know that because we don't have as much time to learn and teach repertoire and build skill, that we may not want to take that classroom time for assessments. I want to be able to do all of those same things, though. So how do I get all the benefits of having one-on-one assessments and providing them immediate feedback and being able to track their progress and all of that. You're, you're giving me softballs because everything you just described is exactly what happens with a, when your students have access to smart music. You pick a piece, you create an assignment, um, you get to customize the assignment as, as you want. So maybe flutes need to play measures eight through 20 and trombones need to play measure 32 to 50. Um, and then you send them the assignments and you build a rubric um, of custom criteria. So this doesn't just have to be about notes and rhythms, um, though it certainly could be if that's what you wanted to focus on. Maybe it's the beginning of a concert cycle. And students will practice. They'll have access to that awesome reference recording. They'll record. They'll send it back to you. Um, and you'll get to grade it. You'll get to listen to it. You get to offer that feedback in writing. And students will have access to it because they can go look back at their old assignments within the grade book. Um, and you'll be able to chart their progress. So that back and forth that used to have to happen in class now can happen in Chrome um, on a web browser. But isn't that uh, just making me have to grade papers at home like all those sucker English teachers? (laughs) You were going to listen to them anyway. um, Yeah, but, you know, during my class time. Yeah, but I, I don't, I don't, Personally, I don't think it's a bad thing that teachers listen to their students. Yeah, um, no, I, I totally agree. I'm just razzing you. Okay, good. <laughs> so, which, I mean, I like playing the devil's advocate, though, because I do want to look at this from all sides. If they're using reference recordings, even on playing tests, isn't that creating a risk of them learning by rote instead of learning by sight? Yeah, um, I, I think that's definitely a risk. However, it's there's also a clear benefit they're getting to access that context, right? One of the things coming from, this is more of a jazz example because that's that's where I've got a lot of background, but sometimes you just don't know what's going on in a big band chart if you don't have access to a rhythm section. These, Or, or maybe a better example even is like a salsa tune. Reading those kinds of rhythms is hard and hearing that context can lock everything in and it can help with style um, in addition to rhythmic accuracy. At the same time, if you wanted to give an assessment in smart music where students didn't have access to the reference recording, that's an option. You can set the assignment to force the accompaniment off so students can practice with it. And then when they send a recording to you, they won't be able to use it. Huh. That sounds pretty smart. Yeah. Does it all integrate with Google Classroom? Because I'm looking at Google Classroom as another way to be efficient. You can export um, your gradebook as a CSV and upload it to Google Classroom. The recordings themselves don't port directly over yet. It's one of the things that we've struggled with, actually. Um, we know how important LMSs are to teachers. Figuring out kind of how each teacher uses their LMS is kind of a tangled web. Some teachers use Schoology or Canvas or Google Classroom or don't use an LMS at all. And so we've we've kind of deliberately got, been patient with that. Um, Okay, back up though. What's an LMS? Oh, sorry. A learning management system. Um, an online platform that uh, helps, like Google Classroom, that, that helps give teachers access to um, kind of all of these options of, in terms of assignments or online quizzes or um, potentially a grade book. Though a lot of schools don't even use their LMS as a grade book. They use PowerSchool or something like that. If you had said CMS, I would have known that. Yeah, right. Yeah. And I could That's, probably come up with about 20 different things that RMS could stand for, and most of them would be inappropriate. <laughs> I, I think going back to like using smart music at home, you mentioned efficiency. And for me, the, the biggest thing is if, if you're still teaching notes and rhythms in class, you're, you're doing it wrong. You don't need to do that anymore. Um, I always, the, the maxim I, I learned was, uh, practice at home and rehearse at school. And when I was a kid, when I was the student, I was like, yeah, 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 whatever. You just want me to practice. 
And then when I actually had to stand in front of a band, I was like, no, I'm serious. This is when we have to work on things like blend and balance. If you come to, if you come to school unprepared, we're wasting time. And, and I think that's the biggest thing that ensemble directors struggle with in terms of efficiency. We're spending time hammering out notes and rhythms, potentially on a kid by kid basis or a section by section basis. And how wonderful would it be if every kid just showed up, felt good about the notes and rhythms, and we got to immediately start working on things like phrasing. Um, and, and that's where smart music really shines because the kids have access to the feedback at, at home. They know if they're playing the right notes or rhythms before they ever get to school. Um, and by building those assignments and making kind of building that culture of home practice, it means that your job as a, as a director is that much easier. You get to work on the stuff that actually matters and, and not the busy work. That is just so invaluable to even comprehend the importance of that. And it would, it would require a paradigm shift for most of us. Yeah. And yeah, I, when I was teaching middle school band, I spent most of my time on notes and rhythms. Well, don't we all? And the irony is, or maybe not irony, more coincidence. I had the same discussion in conducting my community band was I had to say, we are not fixing notes and rhythms here. You need to have them learned when you get here. And then we're going to put it together. Yep. It's funny you would mention context too. True story. I was teaching the eighth grade band at my school. There's a whole 14 kids in it. And they did not have a solid percussionist. There was one girl back there who didn't seem to really know what she was doing. <laughs> did I say that softly enough? And yep. there was no flutes. There was like one trumpet, no, three trumpets in that band, but no low brass. So they were lost most of the time, right? So they're playing Born to be Wild, and I hopped on the drum set. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, here we go. And I'm clicking the sticks. One, two, one, two, three, four. And I just start doing like a, like a rock rhythm. And for the first time, they were able to like lock it in on tempo. Yep. And I stopped playing at the end of the song and they just cheered. It was hilarious to me, <laughs> but you're absolutely right. Having that background, having that context, being able to play it along with recordings. And, and context even more than just helping them get the notes and rhythms means that they're getting ear training, right? This is another thing that tends to fall through the cracks. How, when was the last time a high school band sat and spent a whole rehearsal period working on oral skills? And instead now students can get some of that at home by helping sort out the context with technology. Hey, I have great news too. Yeah. My principal gave me permission to start a choir at my school as well. Awesome. Bow. It, I know it's crazy. It has to be before school. I actually have been pushing for a choir for the last couple of years. It's a Catholic school. Yeah. How do you not have a How choir? To Catholic? Have a, anyway, we shouldn't say that too loud. My principal will hear me through the sands of time or <laughs> the energy of the universe. Anyway. Uh, so, so I've, I'm going to be starting a choir next year. And is smart music still viable for the same kinds of things for choir? Absolutely. Um, I, I think the, the disclaimer would be that the, the library itself for choir is smaller than it is for band or orchestra. Um, but there's still some great stuff in there. Z Randall's troop, you know, some, some real classic stuff that, that a lot of choirs perform. Um, and you can upload your own music, which is something that we know a lot of choir teachers do. So when you upload a music XML file, that's a fancy file name for any something that comes from almost any piece of music notation software. So it doesn't matter if it comes from Finale, Sibelius, MuseScore. Um, you can upload it into Smart Music, the whole score, and then you can parse it out. And Smart Music will automatically generate an accompaniment. So if I then go in and say I'm a tenor two, then um, it'll show me the tenor two part and it'll play all of the other parts for me as an accompaniment. Um, so if you are able to upload your own music, that definitely makes, um, makes for a great choir experience. My mind is super blown right now. <laughs> um, well then, so the other thing you can do is you can actually edit the music XML file directly in Smart Music now. Um, this feature is still in beta, but uh, you're, you can make adjustments. So maybe the, the desk camp part on, on the soprano line needs to be separate or be dropped an octave or um, something like that. You can make those adjustments after you upload and then um, assign it to kids after the adjustments. Wow. Or simplify a part. Yep, definitely. That is so cool. That is just so, that's, I, why did this not exist when I was teaching before? <laughs> 
yeah. I, or when I was in high school. Yeah, this would have been a huge game changer. Um, but yeah, I can I can't imagine now. Okay. Just I, just like preparing all state etudes or something when I was in high school would have been t- so different. Holy smokes! Right. Hey, I had I, a I metronome. Say, I had a metronome. Yeah. I still remember on my first uh, like two or three years teaching evaluation forms when my principal or vice principal had come in and observed me teach. One of the things they were assessing me on was use of technology in the classroom. And I remember being completely stumped on that because they would ask me, well, what technology are you using? I'm like, well, I don't, I don't need any. I have a CD player. Like I have a speaker system. Sometimes I use the, the, you know, lavalier microphone. That's a clip on microphone for those of you who don't know what a lavalier (laughs) is. And that was like it. I always felt kind of guilty that I didn't use more technology, but I also didn't feel like I needed it. But now I do. Yeah. Okay, Ryan, I've asked you all the easy questions. Can I ask a hard one? Yeah, I do want to offer a disclaimer about the um, making adjustments to a score. We sure. make music, of course, does assume that these are public domain pieces. <laughs> that you want to make sure you're always respecting copyright when you make those kinds of adjustments. Yeah, go for Beethoven. Yep, exactly. All right, good to know. Or what? What else are public domain pieces? Um, I mean most of the classic composers and of course by classic composers, I'm referring to Baroque classical and romantic composers. Um, U S copyright law kicks in in the 1920s. Um, and so stuff that was written before that is usually good to go. I, I recommend going to IMSLP, um, which is a database of public domain music. They're really good about labeling it and they have a search function. And we'll add that into our show notes for this episode. So you can find public domain yep. pieces. I bet I'll be able to find some good choral two-part stuff on there, right? Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Because I don't think my kids are going to be ready for four-part yet. Yeah. <sighs> okay, so here's the hard question. Are you ready? I'm ready. How many and which of other software programs would I need to replace just one purchase of smart music? Oh, gosh. Because I wouldn't need... <laughs> A metronome, if I have smart music, because it has a built-in metronome, right? Yeah, it has a built-in metronome. has a built-in. Oh, and can I just throw one more thing in there? Yeah. I used to love, when I taught beginning band before, I would just put in the CD for CD. (laughs) I would put in the the compact audio disc, for those of you who don't know what a CD is, (laughs) into the stereo and hit play on this on the standard of excellence backgrounds and i would just let it go and they would count it off the kids would play and i'd be able to be hands free going around because i didn't have to conduct and i'd go around and fix kids body positions and hand positions and tuning slides and and whatever it just totally freed me up to give that one on one personalized instruction and smart music will let me do that too yeah absolutely um so so you did, you could replace a tuner, a metronome, whatever you're using to record practice logs. Um, Smart Music also has an analytics feature that'll show you how many minutes a student practiced in a given time frame. You could replace however you're doing playing tests, whether that's with recordings on Google Classroom or um, something else. You would replace potentially some of that audio equipment to play backgrounds for method books in class. Um, yeah, all of that's covered. So there's a Facebook group for people that teach with smart music educators. Um, It's over 2000 people now it's called teaching with smart music. I'm in the group. So you can ask me questions if you're getting started with smart music, if you have any um, questions or things seem confusing. Um, So there's some of that, a a touch point right directly with uh, the company as well. So if you're thinking about joining, uh, thinking about using smart music or um, already are definitely join the Facebook group and come say hi. So obviously smart music can do a lot for us, but what if we don't have the budget? I mean, sure, a teacher account is less than 50 bucks, but that could be a new piece of concert music for our ensembles. That's why I want to talk to Steven too, because as much as smart music can do for us, 
and programs like it can do for us, what else could work? Steven is all about using cheap or free tech options, and he shares with us some ways that he gets funding for the tech options that he has and uses in his classroom. So let's see what he had to say to help me in my search for maximum efficiency. Well, my name is Stephen Keys. I am band director at Bondrit Middle School in Frankfort, Kentucky. Uh, I've been at Bondrit for uh, six years, and I've been teaching for a total of 20. Uh, at Bondrit, I teach band six through eight, uh, but I'm also part of our district's technology team. That's how this uh, fascination with technology kind of got started. Uh, they started a technology team a couple years ago, and lo and behold, they actually chose a band director to be a part of it. I didn't think I would get chosen for that because of being a band director, but uh, uh, I love teaching. I love uh, all of it. I don't like anything we can do to help our kids learn and to achieve. That's what we should do. So so how do you use technology in your current band room and how does that, you know, get the kids excited and, you know, just tell us about your experience with technology. Well, part of what you said earlier about um, not being exposed to it, and that's the issue that a lot of people have is we teach how we are taught. And so uh, as we, um, as I run my band room every day, I think back to how my band directors taught me. And so I'm trying to emulate them. And um, I would like to think that if they had the technology back in the day, they would have used it. The reason they didn't have used technology, they didn't have it. Uh, a couple of the things that we do in my band room is we're, we're a Google school. And so we use the uh, Google suite for education. And it's it's been wonderful for uh, really uh, getting information out to the kids and for them getting documents back to me in a, in a quick, in a quick manner. Uh, as like for today, I had a sub and I was able to sit at home this morning and put everything in the Google classroom for them to do and for the sub. And I didn't have to get up and type up lesson plans and make photocopies and do all that fun stuff. And so, uh, that's part of, that's part of what we do. Uh, one of the big things that I did is I was trying to solve a problem and my problem was assessment. I had a hard time hearing all of my kids play individually without wasting rehearsal time. Uh, I have 77 kids uh, in my eighth grade band and it's only me in the room. And so if I try to hear each individual kid uh, play, that's a week of class time gone because you want to hear them, but you got to give them feedback. Kids want feedback. And so uh, the biggest thing this year, besides the Google suite, has been the use of Flipgrid. Um, the it's a video-based program where the kids can record themselves and send them to me, and I can give them feedback. Uh, I can post a flip uh, every two weeks and let them know that by a certain Friday, your, your recording is due, and I'm able to... Um, see the see and hear the kids play uh their playing assessment provide feedback instantly and, and move on that sounds like a really helpful tool i love that you said that you're using it to solve a problem that you had uh i think that that's the whole pur purpose of technology is to help us solve problems and be more efficient as well and yes uh, band directors always call me and they say how can I implement technology in the room? And, I'm, and I asked them, I said, well, what problem are you trying to solve? And they're like, well, they didn't have any problems. I'm like, well, then don't change what you're doing. If what you're doing is working, and if you've got enough hands in the room and enough ears in the room and you like the direction things are going, why change? Don't just implement technology just to be doing it. My focus has been on the performance-based classroom the band room, choir room, orchestra room. There are so many, I think, resources out there for um, your general music classes, um, elementary classroom. There's some things out there, but that's, that's, that's not what I do, so I haven't spent my time there. So my whole thing is I've been trying to find ways for that crotchety old band director, the grumpy choir director, and the orchestra teacher to find ways to in, to incorporate technology into their room so it can, uh, can help them out a little bit. Kids today learn that way. 
they've, you know, this generation of kids that we're teaching uh, today have grown up with technology. They don't know any other way about it. And so it's up to us to come up with some ways to, to do it. And it's hard in the performance-based room. It's hard in the band room to use technology because kids are in band because they want to play their horns. Right. So do you struggle in your school with availability if you're requiring students to create and send you videos and access Google Classroom? Do you ever have a kid who goes, I just can't access Google Classroom at home? Do they have issues like that? We have, we have a few issues like that. Um, we are a one-to-one school with Chromebooks. And so every kid in the school, except for one kid, we have one kid in the school who, uh, whose parents won't sign off on for them to let them have a Chromebook. Um, but they, they can take them home and they can bring them back and forth and they do all their assignments and they work with Chromebooks. So every kid has one. And if there's a kid who doesn't have internet access, I will let them take five minutes to go record theirs at the beginning or end of class. Or, um, they, we, we have recently purchased, um, a few hotspots so they can, check out a hotspot, go home and record it if there's issues like that. We've tried to think through everything uh, when it comes to things that will get in the way of kids and technology. So what you've already said, Google Classroom, and then what was the video one you said? Flipgrid. Flipgrid. Um, So that's two. What would you say are your top three tools for using in the music classroom? The other two big ones that I use a lot are uh, Note Flight and Note Flight is a music notation program. Uh, Note Flight also has a, a subsection called Note Flight Learn. And so I can write an exercise in my Note Flight mm-hmm. and send it out to the kids uh, in Google Classroom, and it shows up in their Google Classroom. So I can make a playing test and send it out, and they can open up the Google Classroom and record it. Uh, and it's it's an easy program. We have spent... Uh, a little time with it in the classroom and the kids, because that's how kids learn, they catch on to all the, the tricks and tips and they figure it out pretty quick and note flight learn. And then the other one that the kids kind of are really into is called Soundtrap. And Soundtrap is a music uh, sequencing type program um, similar to the garage band. And so the kids can make their own little backing tracks and they can put their own mixes and jams together. And they really have fun doing that. The good news is I, even though our school district is a one-to-one district and we bought some hotspots for the kids, everything I try to do, we never have enough money in the music world. And so my goal is to find things that are really inexpensive, but high quality or even better than that free. And so I know like, for example, on Flipgrid, there's a free version of Flipgrid that will do everything anybody wants to do with it. Um, Soundtrap uh, is very inexpensive. Uh, there is a free, you can get a demo version of it that will let you do some things, um, but the paid version isn't that expensive and it's easy to, to use. So the trick is to not break the bank. Have you ever used a smart board? Do you have a smart board in your classroom at all? Well, smart boards. Um, For our purposes at our school, we have a few smart boards, but since every kid has a Chromebook, they pretty much have their smart board in front of them. And so uh, I can, like I say, through the Google apps for education, I can put anything I want uh, out there and the kids instantly have access to it on their Chromebooks. Uh, And so we have a, we have a few smart boards in the, in the school, but they're really kind of going to the wayside. What about a projector? Do you use a projector a lot? I use my projector uh, every day. I have my lesson outline, uh, the rehearsal outline on the board, any kind of announcements or any kind of notes or things that the kids may need to to know for upcoming events and things like that. Um, I have a, I also have a harmony director that I use uh, during my band class. What, what is a harmony director? A harmony director is, it's from Yamaha, and it is a keyboard, but it's also got a built-in 
metronome. It's got a built-in tuner. Um, I can uh, transpose pitches quickly on it. It can. I can work on balance and blend uh, by playing chords and hit a button and it'll hold the chords. Then I'm able to hit other buttons and make the third louder or make the fifth louder. So kids can kind of start hearing balance and blend and how parts fit together uh, when they play chords and things like that. Hmm, interesting. Um, I have to admit that part of part of why I wanted to have you on is because my principal just asked me to submit some things that I want for my classroom next year. So I'm kind of like, hmm, what what is it that I really need and want? Because I do so well with whatever I'm given. You know what I mean? Yes. So yes. I, I don't have a, a classroom full of instruments, yet I can go down to the dollar store, spend 20 bucks and, and bring in a, a whole class full of instruments, you know, just, I, I'm good at, I'm very resourceful and efficient, right? So how do yeah. I like figure out what I want that will truly enhance what I'm going to do uh, without proving that I'm not resourceful? Do you get what I'm saying? It's like this, this delicate balance. I feel like I'm, I'm treading. There is a balance between it. I try to tell the people that no one really and truly likes to sit and talk about music. Uh, people like doing music, you know, uh, now you have those uh, professors and those upper echelon people uh, who love to sit around and discuss everything, but kids don't like to talk about music. And so I've been trying to find ways in my general music classrooms. I teach a seventh grade and an eighth grade general music classroom um, to find ways to get those kids to create and the soundtrack has been great because you don't really need any musical training. You can tell if it sounds good. You can tell if it's not right without having the musical training. Um, I've also had the kids use uh, non band kids use the note flight program just to work on some basic composing and creating music. I don't have enough funds and instruments to just put instruments in everyone's hand. I barely have enough to, staff the band and so anything you can find to let the kids make music and create um, is a whole lot better than anything you're going to put on a smart board um, I mean you can pull up YouTube videos and watch other people do it but that's only fun for a while yeah I do I do love that you said nobody likes to sit and talk about music that people prefer doing music. And I think that's so true in every single age group that we touch. So, so what are your kind of go-to, we, we've talked about go-to softwares and online programs and stuff, but what about like apps? Like if you're going to have a kid who comes to you and is like, you know, Mr. Keys, can I get something on my phone that will help me be a better saxophone player? Are there some like handheld device things that you recommend? There are every kid in a, every band and orchestra program. Well, I guess it would work for choir too. Should have a metronome and a tuner. And there's so many out there that um, are free and they work just fine. Uh, I have some colleagues who refuse to use the apps as their tuner because when they first came out, they weren't real accurate, but they've gotten so much better. There is a really good tuner. It's called the Bandmate Chromatic Tuner. And it was created by a band director in, uh, I believe, South Carolina. And what I like about the Bandmate Tuner is you can choose what instrument that you want it to be set for. And it shows you not only are you in tune with the with the with the squiggly line that goes across it, but it shows you the pitch on the staff that you're playing. So you're kind of reinforcing um, note names. Um, the really cool thing is about some of the things we've talked about: Soundtrap and Flipgrid. There's they work on the phone too. Um, each one of those uh, Soundtrap has a great app that works on the phone and i know that because my family gets mad at me because when we're taking road trips i'll be sitting in the 
and it's my wife's turn to drive, I'll be sitting in the passenger seat making beats and they get really annoyed at me. But most of the things have an app on it. Now, the hard thing about apps is that they go away so quick. There's a couple of things that were out just last summer that were amazing that my kids love. They no longer exist. But as far as apps and things go, um, um, metronomes, tuners, I did find one uh, recently that I've been kind of messing with and it is called Musical.ly. Have you played with Musical.ly at all? I haven't. It is a Instagram type app that lets you record things and um, add music to them. And so instead of just having the Instagram video or picture of the puppy, now the puppy running down the street, now you can add tunes, tunes to it. And it's kind of it's kind of neat. And I think once I learn more about the app and show it to the kids, I think the kids will really be into it. I think they'll start posting uh, musically posts all over the place. Huh. That sounds really fun. I love the practical applications of some of these things, you know. Yeah. And and I use the Bandmate Tuner app too. I'm super glad that you brought that up because I I love the the transposition feature for students. Um I just, I like it. It's fast. It's easy. It, it's fast, easy. I have spoken to the guy who made it and um, uh, he, they did a recent update and it's getting better all the time. And I think it's just because people are, are using it and it's, you know, it, it serves its purpose when you need it. All right. So I'm going to take you back to Google Classroom. So let's okay. say that we don't have something like that implemented right now and just, to be fair, like a, a couple months ago, uh, smartmusic.com put out a book that was a collaboration from a bunch of music educators. And I got to talk about how to collect data and share that with parents. And I suggested having an individual folder on your computer for every single student in your program. And that way you can just file their playing tests or videos or performance notes or you know, rubrics and everything like that right into each student's folder, right? So I assume, now I don't use Google Classroom, but I assume that I could do that really easily in Google Google Classroom, right? Absolutely. Uh, once, the one thing about Google that I like is that it's free. Um, if, if, like my personal Google account, when I use my Gmails and all that stuff, you're limited to so much space. But um, my school um, Google account, I have unlimited storage, uh, unlimited access. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's free and it's amazing. Um, there's two ways to do it. Once, once you create an assignment in Google Classroom, inside of your Google Drive, which is the storage um, for all that, a folder is automatically created with the students uh, for that assignment. And then as the students complete their assignment, it goes into that folder. And so it's stored for you. It's stored there until you delete it. And so if, you know, if you put something up, a kid completes the assignment, it's there, they move on to the next assignment. You always have access to that. I also have all of my kids, um, the first day of class, they come in, they get signed up for Google Classroom. I also have them go to the Google Drive and create a folder. Um, and then they share that folder with me. And so I have access to it and they have access to it. And the only thing they keep in that folder are any assignments for that class. And then, so if I need to see something, if I want to keep a record of something, it's all there. I mean, there's so many different ways to do it. And it is, I mean, it, it's just within two minutes, you have it all done. It's so quick and so easy to use. So how long does it take to train ourselves in how to do this? Because I do feel like one of the burdens of technology is the learning curve for ourselves to learn how to do it, get it all set up. Is it going to be worth it for me to go through all that work? What's my time commitment looking like, do you think? Well, it, we, um, it's like anything else. The more you do it, the easier it gets. Um, it, I don't think it the I don't think it takes as long as we we think it might. Um, kids, the kids are able to pick up on it instantly. I mean, they get it. They they've grown up on it. 
uh, we are, that's the one thing I think that holds teachers back is they are intimidated by that learning curve. Um, it is not, it is not hard. It is easy. And the amount of time that you will save using the technology will more than make up for the amount of time you spent learning it. Um, we did a sessions we did sessions over the summer uh, professional development with our whole district where we did throughout the day, we would have little one hour sessions on different aspects of all uh, the technology things that we were trying to implement in our school district. And a lot of people just, I mean, it was just quick. It's, it's simple to use. It's intimidating, but once you get into it, you'll find that it's, it, it really is simple. It's not, it's not hard. So since you're on the technology committee at your school, am I remembering that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you, as the band teacher, are you able to tap into technology funds, like funds that are earmarked for technology for your classroom specifically, or do they kind of reserve those things for the more, you know, quote unquote core classes? <laughs> that, that's uh, probably a pretty see. loaded question. Do you use your influence? <laughs> um, I am. I think as an educator, as a music educator, too many times we have sat around and let things happen to us. Um, I know I've got lots of band director friends who all they do is they spend time in the band room. They don't get out. They're not a, they don't make their self available part of their school. I am the head of the school's budget committee. I am on the um, calendar district calendar committee. I try to get on as many different things as I can because I want input. I want to be able to have some input in, instead of having things done to me. And so um, we need to, yeah, it's a little less to work and it's a couple of days and nights that we have to be away from things and have to do it. But I think it's so important for us to be a valuable part of our school. Um, that way we're no longer considered the, you know, you, you don't have that, the core classes versus the others. Um, and so, yeah, I, I have, I don't have a ton of say when it comes to um, the budget stuff, but I do have some say. And for me, that's enough. Uh, I, I want to, I want a voice at the table. I think that is absolutely brilliant. And I think you're totally right that we we don't always just have to take what we're given. I think that the the more inexperienced teachers tend to just say, this is my budget, this is what I'm stuck with. But if you can create a really compelling case for why you need something in your classroom, why you need this investment in technology for, you know, so that you can offer individualized feedback on student performance exams. You know, that's something that is super essential to the education and learning and benefit of the program as a whole. And so if, yes. if you really can justify that, then why not go after it? You, we don't well, just have to take what we're given. Let's march. <laughs> well, and that's the whole thing is you have to ask. The only thing they can say is no. I love it. I love it. I actually have a, a blog post and like a, a cheat sheet on my website that maybe I'll add that to our show notes on how to create like a single paragraph, really compelling ask that you can use if you're writing a grant or if you're talking to your principal or if you're just getting up in front of your concert and saying, you know, here's what we need and why we need it. So I will add that to the that. show notes. We've, uh... We've even put out a hat, a marching band hat at our concerts and just ask parents, you know, if you can make a, you know, the concert's free, but if you can make a little donation to the band, it'd be great. And just with telling how much you could get, uh, you might get some, you might get a lot, you don't know. Uh, but there's also other funding sources out there, uh, the GoFundMe type places um, on the web that you can put up um, your need and the amount you're looking for. And I've, Personally, haven't done one yet. Um, probably going to do one uh, this summer for next year just to see how it goes. But I hate that we let finances stand in the way of a kid's education. Um, I have, I've tell them, um, 
I tell my kids all the time, I said, I will not let money keep you from doing something. If I have to go out and do it, pay for it myself or whatever, I always, if a kid really and truly wants to learn to play the clarinet, but they can't afford a clarinet and they can't afford reeds, I will go out of my way to get that kid a clarinet and the supplies they need. It's out there. We just got to, we just got to ask for it. Awesome. Cool. Well, is there anything else you want to share with us about technology in the classroom, what we can do to, to implement it, to feel encouraged, to, you know, give us our little rah-rah session. Don't do too much at one time. Find one thing that uh, you want to, you want to implement. Maybe it's looking at Flipgrid or maybe it's a different program that we haven't talked about and you see something where we get in trouble is we try to do too much and we get overwhelmed and we get frustrated and then we just throw our hands up and go back to the old way of doing it. Find one thing and just use it for a while and get comfortable with it and then find something else and then get good with it. And then at, before you know it, it's, you haven't, it hasn't cost you any more time than you normally would have. It's probably saved you time in the long run. And the kids will appreciate it because that's the world they live in these days. Yeah. Awesome. Rah, 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 rah shish, boom, bah. <laughs> Go get some. Hashtag get some. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you, Stephen, for coming on to the podcast today and sharing with us some of how you use technology in your classroom. May we all, this is my wish for all of us, is to have a one-to-one Chromebook ratio. (laughs) (laughs) Hooray! It's it's nice, but it's also, uh, it can be, be careful what you wish for. Let me put it that way. Cool. Well, is there anything I can do for you? Or I I guess we can give a little shout out about the uh, International Music Education Summit, which you're going to be one of the presenters. Do you want to tell us about your session and why everybody should hop on and register so they can come hear you talk? I mean, what I I can't wait for this event. Um, I've done um, another internet based um, webinar type. Uh, PD. And I can't wait to be a part of this one. There's nothing like being able to do professional development in your pajamas. Uh, There's nothing like being able to do professional development and just in a, such a relaxed manner. And so I'm looking forward to the international uh, music education summit. I've been spreading the gospel as much as I can uh, around here and on uh, the Twitters and the Facebooks and all that fun stuff. So I think it's, it's a great event. You're going to, from what I can see, you have put together a fantastic lineup. I can't wait for some of the different events and to hear from some of the people that you have uh, coming in. What I'm planning on doing is going through some of the programs that we talked about uh, today on the podcast and just showing, showing uh, educators just how easy it is to use. Um, We're going to pull it up and I'm going to run them and we're just going to go through them and hopefully, uh, hopefully we can work it out where they can play along while I'm, uh, speaking via the interweb. Uh, but it's, it's, it's going to be a great event. I can't wait. Awesome. Well, I'm super excited that you're going to be joining us for that as well. And obviously it was reading your session notes that made me want to get you on the podcast. So thanks for that. Sweet. Well, thank you for having me. It's, it's been a pleasure. As you can see, Steven's got it super dialed in. Between the tools he told me about and the advantages smart music can provide me as far as assessment, practice tracking, and training tools, I'm going to get things dialed too and into maximum efficiency mode while engaging my students in technology education and improving them as musicians as well. It's all win-win-win around here. I truly hope that you too gleaned some great info from this episode. If you did, I'd love to hear about which tech solution you think is best or what you use in your classroom. Leave a comment on the show notes page for us all to enjoy. With that, I just want to remind you to join me and 25 other presenters like Ryan and Stephen from around the world for the 2018 International Music Education Summit coming in just a few weeks. Register today by going to musicedsummit.org slash register. That's musicedsummit.org slash register and enter the code podcast to claim your 10% off. 
While you have your browser window open, go to smartmusic.com slash enter. For your chance to win, just sign up to try Smart Music for free before the end of the school year, and you could win a Chromebook. You can also find all the information and get started at smartmusic.com slash enter. That's smartmusic.com slash enter. Until next time, my friends, keep teaching on. Thank you.